like always placed the bass as a back instrument, like the thing to just support, but not as a solo instrument. And that, for example, social media, fantastic for this. You have so many good bass players that actually play by themselves and prove that it can be fantastic in solo. And you know, before when a double bass player was like a bassist, like or a musician was like playing solo, it used to be like a kind of a circus exploit. You know what I mean? Like it, it was like virtuoso thing and we were they were all applauding because oh my god technically it's very hard and all that but you will not listen to it in your living room in the background of a dinner but now i find with time i find there are more and more real musician real double bass player musician i insist on double bass player and musician because there are many players any instruments that's not necessarily musician so double bass player musician that play solo and it's beautiful and you will listen to it and you will not think oh my god that car does it does it like it's very good for double bass no you say it's very good and you don't have to add for double bass anymore I had a wonderful time connecting with today's guest. This is one of those conversations where I look up at the clock and two hours have gone by and I didn't even know where the time went. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contrabass Conversations, and we are talking today with Anne Gabrielle Deuce, who has quite a career going for herself already, both on piano and double bass. And you have to check out her Instagram if you haven't. It's just so cool to see her playing both of these instruments and just the way that she communicates is just so great you're going to have a lot of fun with this one you're going to hear her play some piano we're talking about all sorts of comparisons between the double bass and the piano similarities and differences between teaching them playing them i had such a great time talking to her i know you're going to enjoy it quick shout out to our sponsors dorico ear trumpet labs and audacity more on them later but let's dig into this conversation with Anne gabrielle deuce Is it yeah. working? Hey, hey. work. That is yeah. Welcome, welcome to 2021. That's it's hilarious. I was just, I was literally just on the line with a couple people, and so I, I know things were were working, but then it like <laughs> happened. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Usually it's me. Now I'm happy for once. It's not my fault. Usually I'm the kind of girl yeah. that we could spend like five minutes trying to know what's wrong and then I realize that my headphones are not connected to my phone like that's the kind of thing I can do <laughs> <laughs> I know well you sound great now it's 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 funny um because I I you know I used to never do zoom interviews if we go back a year and a half ago um but it was it was almost worse because I would try to do them on Skype and people would say oh yeah I used Skype like eight years ago and they try to dig out their ID or Facebook Messenger or I would do like these phone calls so like everybody seems to know what zoom is these days so this is sort of what I've been I can doing. use it but I don't understand everything my students I teach on half on zoom half on whatsapp uh, Zoom for people mm -hmm. who need like a good sound, WhatsApp for people who don't understand anything about computer. And on Zoom, I, I can answer, I can talk, but um, usually I end up with very strange name because my students change my name. So uh, <laughs> sometimes I'm called Tyrant, sometimes dictator. It makes me laugh. I mean, they're all so funny. <laughs> I I have one I only te I only teach a couple of students. I have one student though. It's always the wrong name when he comes up and it drives him insane. <laughs> so the first couple minutes of the lesson he's like, "I must change my name like it's his brother's name. It's not even a weird thing, but like yeah. If he will it's, not it's, recognize uh, him. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Exactly. Exactly. And it's hilarious because this kid, I teach a couple of high school kids here in San Francisco and he lives like I can almost see his his building. You know, he's so close. But here we are on on Zoom. And so if I have like a name tag on his T-shirt. You will be able to see it. <laughs> exactly. 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 So what's, uh, how is WhatsApp teaching? How, what's it's, it like? I've never taught. It's a... awful. What I do on WhatsApp, it's like I ask, um, I ask my students or pupils to record a video first, then mm -hmm. send it to me. And then we talk massively mm -hmm. about the video I've seen before. And then I can show them stuff and we can talk. But for technique, it's fine. Like you can show, but all about sound, especially on double bass piano, it's fine more or less double bass you need like a good microphone um yep. and i can't do it because i know them in real like for example i can't teach online people i've never seen before with whatsapp 
I already find it very hard with people I've never seen before on Zoom, Skype, or anything with a camera. But um, on WhatsApp, you you can't you, you we really can't decide if it's the online problem or my student problem or my own problem sometimes because I'm not very clear. You know, I like to. I'm a very tactile person. I like to touch a lot. I know in US it's not very recommended, but um, I grab things. I so it's it's very interesting this Zoom teaching because I have to t- change the way I teach. I can't just show or I can't like mm-hmm. I can't ask a student. I can't just hold the arm of a student and ask him if he can feel the weight on his hands or stuff like that. I need to explain. I need to find the right words. So I need to change my whole perspective of how to explain things, how to feel things, how to put words on what I feel, which can be different for whew, but it's it ends up to be very, very interesting. You know what I mean? Oh, I I completely know what you mean. I don't know, especially with the students. I mean, I only have these two students, but even when I've done some master classes and the like over over Zoom, and I don't know... It's certainly I can't wait to get back to in person and and that physical. I mean, it's and especially if if you if you like to, you know, here's the weight, feel the weight. That's got to be particularly frustrating. Um, I don't necessarily know that I'm teaching worse online. Yeah, yeah, I'm just yeah, teaching differently yeah. for me. And I, I yeah, and I'm, I'm a technology nerd anyway. And so I've you know, I've always I, it's been kind of fun to share my screen and and zoom in. I've got all my music on Foursquare and my iPad or uh, I've been working on an arrangement with a student of sports themes. He's really into sports. And so we've been going through in, in my uh, music notation software, we've been like trying different things and playing chords and, oh, that looks good. And so it's kind of become a music theory lesson. Um, but boy, there's nothing like the sound of a double bass through a, like an iPhone speaker. You know, you can't even differ anything below the G string and even the G string. There's like, it's just like this buzz song, you're, right? Yeah, you're very good with technology. For me, it's like already a miracle i have instagram for example a miracle i understand how it works instagram so mm-hmm. i know i can't i don't know how to share my string uh musical notation i will tell you how bad i am once um i was playing um i was playing the piano part for a violin competition i was playing with a, a friend uh Esther Abrami, i don't know if you know about her she's a french violinist and uh she gave me the score on an i on her ipad and so i was playing i was happy and i wanted to turn the page and and I didn't realize, you know, when you practice, the, the iPad is in front of you, but in concert can be a bit higher. Mm-hmm. I touch the screen and all these mm-hmm. colors start to appear and flowers and, and little <laughs> and little cartoons. And uh, because I didn't know they were like a concert mode and I try and because I started to stress my weight, my, my hands were so wet. And so, of course, the pink just stopped to reply and I start to like play, like improvise. And she started to look at me like, what are you doing? <laughs> And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, that's hilarious. So since then, I have a pedal. <laughs> well, that's... A- that yeah yeah the pe- the pedal makes it well that's the that's the that's what scares me about I, I've gotten really into iPad for sheet music and I know p- pianists that's that that's a that can be amazing because you can have all this repertoire there and especially if you're doing collaborative piano you know to have like all all Mendelssohn and and Beethoven and all these scores right there it can be so cool but the scary thing for me about the iPad is you, you don't have that tactile feeling of where you the thing are is, the I score, can't right? learn. I don't know you, but I can't it, learn with a screen. Like every score I learn, I need to have yeah. paper. Um, but mm-hmm. I hate this feeling to have someone next to me in concert to turn page. That's a good thing about double bass. Mm-hmm. Is like you, you, you play and you take so much space anyway that <laughs> no one is around you, like next to you, mm-hmm. next to your like next to your face. Um, but in concert, yeah, in concert, I don't like someone turning page for me. I mean, or someone, or sometimes I'm not lucky enough to have someone to turn page for me. And so the iPad is very nice for this, but to learn impossible. Like, I, I feel like a grandma when I say that, but I I really, (laughs) it's like books, books that I really like. I need to have the physical version. I can't just have the iPad version. It just doesn't stay in my mind. I like to have both. 
I get it. Yeah, I, I definitely interact with a book. And I mean, I, the convenience of digital is so high that I find myself working that way a lot. But I have stacks of books. and I love reading the actual. I, and I think I uh, just like we were talking about how I teach differently on Zoom than in person, maybe better, maybe worse, maybe this, maybe just differently. I, I, it's the same thing with books for me. Like I read books differently when they're when I'm holding the book and I'm able to underline the book. And I can do that on the Kindle app. And, the, and there are some advantages, uh, you know, if I'm in the, on a plane or something to have you know a basically infinite library with me but yeah having the physical book is is so incredible do you do you so if you're reading so you're learning on paper do you then scan the piece into the ipad when you're going to perform without a page turner i discovered do you have an iphone i discovered on, on iphone if you press a long time on the not app you can scan everything and mm -hmm. send everything in PDF. So I have mm -hmm. my fingering, I have my colors, I have my little uh, glasses cartoon to say, hey, hey careful. Um, thing you can't add like <laughs> manually on, on your iPad. And as well, like you have this thing that if you learn a score in a specific edition, if someone give you uh, another edition of the same piece, you're lost, you know, the note, you know, you're boring, but because it's mm -hmm. not visually the same, it's a different score. It's like if you're sight reading again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I had an interesting experience. I'd love, I'd love to know, because you've performed with the iPad. I, I did, I don't play piano at all, but I did my, but I have conducted over the years and I did my first conducting gig off the iPad maybe a year and a half ago. And it was interesting because usually you have the score and it's bigger and, and, but the, the thing I liked about the iPad and conducting off of it was I would look down and I would be looking at the same page all the time. It was something where like, when I have the score open, maybe I'm looking in the upper left corner, maybe I'm looking in the lower right. It's like, it was easy. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I found it easier to, to uh, find where I was, but to me, because it doesn't have all these pages, if I made a mistake, like what you were talking about and I flipped the page <laughs> wrong, which I did in that concert, I'm like, oh no, because there's no physical reference, right? You're just like lost in this digital thing. First, if I'm playing solo, either on double bass or piano, I don't use score. Mm -hmm. It freaked me out to have something in front of me. I, I don't know. I, if I have something in front of me, I have to read it. You know, it's like when you're wait, waiting mm -hmm. for the tube and you start to read all these ads on the wall, like you read them so many times, like Costa Coffee, anything like Starbucks thing. Like you, you read every single line, even so you, mm -hmm. you don't have to read, you know, this publicity since a long time. That's the same with a, with a score. If I have a score in front of me, I start to read it. Even so I know it and I can't really escape. I can't focus on. If I have a score in front of me, I can't interact with the audience as much as if I'm like free. Um, I'm doing all this gesture with yeah. my hands, but I forgot that you're only going to have the sound. So you, you have to imagine. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, think, I think everybody gets but, it. <laughs> um, but I use the iPad when I'm doing chamber music because sometimes there are some, usually I know by heart my parts, but when I play like for one and a half, there are some little parts I'm not sure. And I don't want to, I don't want to have a memory slip because it's not just my responsibility. I will put the other person in a bad place if I do a mistake, like too many mistakes. To be honest, I do mistakes. So I will say if I do too many mistakes. Uh, so it's kind of reassuring to know that I've got the iPad somewhere, but I know by heart more or less. I will not be able like to side trade with an iPad, not side trade, but like to, to play in concert, something I am not sure about with an iPad. You know what I mean? And if I can, mm -hmm. I and know, usually I what exactly, I do is like, yeah. if I have scores, mm -hmm that are only one turn page or, or like I can put three pages on the piano, then I take the actual score. So I'm always switching. Mm -hmm. I mean, I used to always switch because my last concert was one year ago, thanks to this fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. Yep. Yeah. Me too. It's funny. I, I, I almost, it's, it, it's like re it's thinking back a year ago. It's like the early scenes in a disaster movie or something like that. Like I'm remembering what I was doing. What were like uh, early February here. I had just come back from the, from the UK. Actually, I was in Leeds. I was filming an online uh, base oh, course nice. for discover double base. And I remember, 
Yeah, and I remember I was hearing some news of, oh, things are happening in China. And then here in the United States, uh, our, the West Coast, where I live, is where the virus started to, to break out. But I still had like four more trips after this point last year. And I, and I remember March 7th or 8th or something was my last concert. And it was, we'd invited this wonderful bassist named Xavier Foley out here to San Francisco for this annual bass event, which you would be amazing for, by the way. So some someday after... After 2021 when we get travel because <laughs> let's talk <laughs> um, but but um so he came out and it was that weird moment where uh they just it was an event for kids and they decided the kids couldn't attend but we could still have the event so poor he Xavier did it by himself six hours with it he played it for our video camera and and then like 10 10 adults and then we played one of andres martin's bass pieces and that was the last time my <laughs> bass has left my flat so so and and i i've had some chats with the other members of that bass quartet and it's like it's a dark scene for everybody um and i know that i are you in london right now where, i'm basically where, okay, in my okay, so two months the, in the house like if you uh, if you look for me i'm here <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, me too. And like, I love cities. I love big cities. And I'm in downtown San Francisco. But boy, I sort of wish I had a country home at the moment. It'd be kind of nice to not because I don't know how it feels in London right now. But it's it's pretty. Um, it's been weird the last year in this big city that I live London in. Is not only we have the pandemic and um, without being too political, like um, we have our little Trump as well. And, um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, there is a pandemic, but there is a Brexit now. And and the consequences mm -hmm. are for the mood, for everything, like for money, mood. Uh, it had better times. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, at yeah. the same time, you know, today I asked my followers on Instagram, I asked them how they were. Because I realized that, you know, how you always talk about yourself on your social media and you try to show what you did and to interact with people. But I really wanted to know how people were instead of, because they always ask me, oh, I am, like, how was my day? And I thought that was very cute, but I wanted to know. And I talk with so many people that were not very well. And I realized that as musicians, we're very, very lucky in a way. Unlucky because we can't perform, but lucky in a way that we can still communicate with people through um, internet like we can still play for people we can still bring things for people we can still be a musician you know what i mean like like um i i have no example but when you do something else if you can't do what you do you lose a bit of not your personality but you lose a bit of what makes you as a musician whatever like performing or not performing you you still keep this a side of yourself. Oh, it's very hard to explain. Sorry, but what I mean is no, I understand. I understand. Yeah, yeah. It's it, you know, it's interesting because musicians. Um, it's been interesting from my perspective because I've been doing things online for a long time, and I, I about five years ago, I decided I was just going to make this my career, which it's only sort of five become, years ago. You know, which is. B well, I, 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 I don't want to bore you with my backstory, but I've been doing this sort of work for a long time. Like I started this podcast 15 years ago or something like that, which is bonkers. Um, but I, I had a few different phases to my career and I went and I took a full time uh, teaching and conducting job back in Chicago. And then my wife got, uh, uh, she's a, a radiology, uh, she's a radiologist and faculty here at UC San Francisco. And, and I had this Chicago career and I was playing and all these different groups and teaching university there and and then oh we're moving to san francisco apparently so all that work evaporated and so i decided do i want to try to play a bunch of gigs and do that sort of thing in san francisco where there are so many bass players already doing that or i i had this podcast and i thought what if i just pretend this was my job <laughs> and focused on this and just every day wake up and treat it like a job um i saw so it back in late 2015 early 2016 i started just treating it like that so i've had this for forever but I, I i sort of had two podcasts like when i was doing a million other things and then recently so that's a very long way of saying I, i've kind of been focused 
focusing on this for five years. And so I've been sort of planning for a pandemic without realizing <laughs> I'm, I'm sort of glad, I'm sort of glad I wasn't trying. Cause I, I, all the, the only playing I'd been doing in recent years was subbing in the San Francisco symphony. So apart from not doing that, and I am also stuck in my flat, you know, my life has changed a lot less than other musicians, but it's been really interesting to see how musicians adapt this last year and, and put themselves Musician out there. Musician and institution, like I remember, so I used to study at Royal College of Music in London and I had no social media when I was over there. But when I left college, um, for two years, one of my friends was like pushing me to go on social media and I was too shy, but she ended up like created the account for me. Again, Estelle's a violinist I was talking about. And um, um, and I remember that when he started to work, when I post like my, actually he started to work when I post my first double bass video. Like mm. piano was all right, but I posted double bass as a curiosity, you know, just to try experiment. And I was so surprised to see how many people were interested to listen to double bass. I know it sounds bad like this, but like, mm. I, I, I didn't know like so many people will, will love it. Anyway, what I'm saying is like, I remember that when he started to, to work, so many people from Royal College used to make fun of me, like say stuff like, who does she think she is with her Instagram and started to mock me. And in a way be jealous when I actually started Instagram because I had less concerts than before. So I needed to do some promotion. And, and so they used to make fun of me. And a few, two months ago, Royal College um, called me and asked me if I could do a talk for their students to convince them to start social media. So it's, it's funny to see how in three years things change completely yeah. and especially these last months like it, it it's kind of nice i like i think people should not be stuck on social media just they should not have just an online online life oh hard to say online life try <laughs> 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 yes. Online life, yeah, exactly right. Yeah, but, I know. <laughs> but at the same time, they should not judge technology or change or judge the way people try to con communicate with other. I think it's nice to to know both. It's nice to like bring your own life in your online life and and bring your online life to the real life. This is an amazing tool. That's why I say like before I say like musician we're lucky because imagine if the same thing happened like five years ago, only five years ago. Mm -hmm. I knew nothing of, I mean, I don't know about you, but me, uh, I knew uh, first technology was not good enough. I mean, how can you record? Now we have a phone, we can record ourselves. We play in our living room, pyjama or not pyjama. We record ourselves and we can mm -hmm. like post what we just did. And it may not be the best sound ever, but it's still enjoyable. We have cameras that we don't look like a Picasso project. We actually can see the face. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I that's know, why yeah. it's, it's in that way that I say we're very lucky because we can still do what we like. Of course, it's difficult. Of course, like, um, it's nice if we can have some function or you know what I mean, but we, we're lucky that it's happening now and we're lucky that platform, online platform exists to link us with an audience. It's so, it's so crazy. I mean, th you think how recent all these Instagram, uh, YouTube, all these things. If let's just rewind 10 years. Think about if this pandemic had happened in 20, 10 or 20, 2011, right? Okay, well, there was, there was YouTube. I think that YouTube still was at that point where you could only upload 10 minutes. Uh, we were just so much in such a different place. And in terms of being able to connect, you know, it's, it's just crazy how much, how much has changed and how cool that the Royal College of Music, you know, you, you had all these colleagues that were, that were sort of scoffing at what you're doing and, and how, how great, and that's a smart move of, of them to bring you in and, and give some advice. Um, I have done, I would love your thoughts on this. I have done several clinics on how to market yourself online and that sort of stuff. And I, I have no idea because I, I am just my, everything I've done is an accident. I started this podcast back in 2007 and which like, you know, is a different era for podcasting. I never really, I stopped doing anything online for five years because I just got busy with other projects. I have ended up with an audience um, for various things I do. But if someone asks me, how do you do it? I have no no stinking idea. I just like, I kept, I kept putting things out, but like, what advice did you give in that talk? I say like, for example, if you think you're going to mark, promote yourself on social media, then if you just do it for this, then don't do it. I mean, do it, but it's mm -hmm. not going to be very interesting mm -hmm. either for you or for your audience. I think people should see social media in a way to interact with other, you know what I mean? First thing mm -hmm. is contact, so it's communication mm -hmm. the same way you want for me, what I find fantastic on social media is like 
you know, when you do a concert and at the end, some people come to talk to you, always the same type of person, always the same age range. Mm -hmm. And when you're very tired or very excited, but you're not really there. And so you always meet the same kind of people. You always end up saying the same thing. And me, particularly me, now it's getting better. But me, I have these things that my mouth is independent to my brain, <laughs> which mean like when, you know, when, <laughs> when you're shy, most people are reserved and they don't talk too much. When I'm shy, I, I say all oh, these things like stupid thing because i'm so afraid people are gonna think bad of me that i control the situation by saying all these stupid things that then i'm sure they will find <laughs> they will find me stupid <laughs> there is no doubt and and after every concert like when people come to see me um i've got this giggle <laughs> I, i'm i'm very bad like um when people ask me in real ask me um, for concert i always end up promoting my friend saying like oh that's very nice but you know i have this friend like she will do it so much better or and social media you post and then you take your own time to answer to people or you you can talk to people i remember once i was uh, in the green room after a concert of a uh, Joshua Bell and I met Joshua Bell and I met his pianist that I thought was amazing, Sam Haywood. And I introduced myself and instead of saying I'm Anne Gabriel, I always say I'm Gabby. So we talk, he was very nice. The thing is, because I say I'm Gabby, I never say my real name. People can't find me and I don't have this little card. Like uh, I'm not that kind of person that give her card to everyone. And I remember that the day after I like one of his picture on Instagram. And so he remembered me and he started to talk with me and follow me and we started to like talk about music and give me some advice that's a great way like to have no um, intermediary you said like this mediator between two people so right. what i will say is like right. post thing but don't expect don't do it to have likes or followers or concerts just do it to show to inspire people to have a little diary of what you do because in a way it's nice to know like to see the evolution um don't be too shy but don't try to promote yourself in a way that you don't exist because you have to be regular don't don't try to appear like smarter than you are or more beautiful than you are or don't don't think like you need to be a certain way to please people use it in a way to show that you exist show that you're here like so people if they google you they can find something about you but do it in a way to communicate with a lot of people meet more people get out of your bubble like i talk for example for me instagram makes me like double base i already had a very uh, love and hate relationship relationship with double bass I wanted to quit so many times and because I've got so many opportunities since I'm a child with double bass I never quit and it was my um try and horse for piano actually it's like I started with like Royal College for example I had an amazing audition when I applied like amazing I never play like this in my whole life I play only that day it's like if the double bass was playing for me you know and and just after I auditioned for piano and it was the opposite it was like the I never play like this in my entire life but I think when I started with the pieces I was better since the day of my audition <laughs> of course after the I re-auditioned after and they, they took me uh, as well but what I'm saying is like what am I saying actually I'm lost <laughs> <laughs> oh he's talking oh you say that you, no yes top I, was, I had a yep. love-hate relationship like it was my train horse but when I started to post this video on Instagram and I discovered that people actually love listening to double bass and I started to meet new people as well like, uh, by the way before I forgot I talk about you with uh, Phoebe Russell, Sam Morel, Dan Stiefer, Joseph Conyers, and Leon Bosch. And <laughs> we know a lot. We know a lot of the same no, people, the don't thing, we? That's all hilarious. These people, <laughs> I met them through Instagram. All of them say so many great things about you. I think I rarely hear so many great things as a human being and as a musician, like um, so many compliments about someone. And before I forget, I'm sorry, but Leon Bosch wrote me something about you. And I asked him if I could repeat it because that's basically what I would like people to think about me one day. He said, wait, yeah. you ready? Be ready to blush, my friend. <laughs> he said, he's a wonderful human being and warm and a warm personality. He's a force of nature and one of the most enthusiastic musicians I know and about you. And I thought like, I wanted to tell you that before I forgot because that's my life goal. <laughs> This episode is brought to you by Ear Trumpet Labs. These are hand-built microphones out of Portland, Oregon, and they make an excellent mic for upright bass called Nadine. Barry Green got to try out this mic at our 2020 Online Bass Summit where Ear Trumpet Labs was a sponsor, and he was singing its praises all weekend long. 
It's an instrument mounted condenser mic with an incredibly clear, natural sound and great feedback rejection. It's durable and works with in ears, monitors, you name it. Not to mention, Christian McBride, Barry Bales, and Missy Raines are all Nadine users. Whether it's classical, jazz, Americana, or bluegrass, this mic seriously delivers, and they're offering a free t shirt, especially to Contrabass Conversations listeners with a purchase of a mic. Just visit www. Dot eartrumpetlabs.com slash contrabass to claim yours and check out Nadine. I am so proud to have my course with Discover Double Bass Beginner's Classical Bass out in the world. This was a long time coming, friends, and this course is designed, as the name implies, for beginner bassists who want to learn how to play classical music or for more experienced players who wish to revisit the foundations of technique. The course is comprised of 66 lessons over four hours and covers a wide range of topics on classical bass, which will make a real difference to you playing. It is the perfect course for beginners. I feel weird saying that since it's my course, but I, I definitely believe in it. To build a solid foundation of double bass technique and to help you feel confident playing. Many of the lessons include transcriptions of the pieces, exercises, and etudes, so you have everything you need to practice at home. I spent hundreds of hours putting this together over the last few years. I'm so glad to see it out in the world. We have a link to it in the show notes, or just visit discoverdoublebase.com slash Jason Heath. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 I am I am blushing. I also it might be hard to tell because I got a little bit of sun here in, in the California uh, winter. We, we still but well, that's that's high praise coming from Leon. And, you know, that's that's um, that's the but the only reason Leon and I met is because of social media, you know, and and it's that's I think anybody who approaches and it sounds like you absolutely do this is approaches social media as some sort of self-improvement project. I think if you can think of it like that, you'll never go wrong rather than like, Hey me, here's how great I am. Me, me, me. Look at this. Look at, look at me doing these cool things versus like, like uh, Joe Conyers is a great example. He makes these Instagram videos and he works toward them, right? It's like a practicing project. And then he puts himself out in public and anything you can do to just consistently put yourself out in public, you will develop skills that that will apply in the music world. Anything you can do that involves presenting something in public. That's what we do as musicians. That's what you do as a pianist or a bassist or or an author or Leon with his wonderful publications and research that he puts out. I think anything we get so uh, we get so uh, introverted as musicians oftentimes in our practice room working on our thing, waiting to get permission to go out and play a concert. So, you know, we think about your colleagues, your your cohort back at, at the Royal College, you know, who are you to put stuff out on Instagram? Well, it's a, it's it seems to me like it was a self Improvement and is a self improvement project. It's for many you. things as well. It's like, for example, all these spaces I just talked about. Like, we start to talk on Instagram, and there are fantastic people that I didn't know exist because my problem is like, I've always been very interested like to listen to cellists, pianists, violinists, but because at the beginning I was kind of an outsider for double bass, and I never been like passionate mm -hmm. about double bass repertoire. And I, I mean, it took me time to be um, really in in the double bass world because I always like switch between two worlds. And it's kind of make me learn about it. Like Instagram make me realize like how so many inspiring people exist. And, and like, for example, like it's through Instagram that I started to uh, play with um, Bojo Paradjik. Like, and for me, it was a huge inspiration and I was so flattered to play with him. But when I started to talk with him, I had no idea who he was. Like, I remember I was criticizing one of his videos, not for the way he played, but for the way he, 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 he used to frame his video. I used to make fun of him for this mm -hmm. and we started to talk and then he saw my Instagram he saw that I played very well we met because we wanted to do like an Instagram video and when we started to play together he said uh, actually you know, you know what we need to we need to do a whole production I want to play with you it will never happen if I was not on social media or same thing for piano you know what I mean like it's extend mm -hmm. the way you see music as well I remember when I mm -hmm. went out of college um, for me music was important the way I saw it was how to please people, but in a way that I was, if, was I good enough? Like, how am I going to be judged? Or does it worth, like, what I'm doing? Does it worth the fact that people pay for a ticket, for the babysitter, for the parking, like, to park the car, you know what I mean? And I remember when I post something on Instagram, one day I received this message, say, from a teenager saying, like, hey, um, hey, I just uh, watched your video this morning, and I just wanted to tell you that it's not going well in my family these days, but every morning... Morning, I go to school and every time I come back to school I listen to your video and it's make me feel better thank you for this I mean I will remember this message for a long time because that's how I realized why we play we don't play like for a small 
bubble of um, same people and to we don't we don't play to show that we're the best we play because we want to touch people we want to inspire people 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 <laughs> people uh, <laughs> we want to um, that's why that's what music is for it's not just the industry that's why I'm saying promote yourself on social media yes of course if you if you are on social media i mean of course you promote yourself you're not going to talk just about your your garden or i don't know but but remember that it's remember that it's a way to that music is just here like to communicate to inspire it can be fun can be sad but at the end it's not about how look you how great you look or or how how incredible is your technique it's about can you touch people or not do you inspire people or not can you communicate a feeling to people or not that's it and that's a very healthy way to see i mean i think social media can be destructive if you just think about yourself if you just start to look at the like and followers you have for depression after one month and i have to say like everyone gonna go through this phase for sure like i'm sorry to say but yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's it's a tough it's a tough balance because these anybody who's seen the social dilemma on oh, Netflix or if you haven't I've I seen you it. check it out uh, and of course yeah of course it's it's particularly interesting me living here in San Francisco with you know the Bay Area where all these companies are based and you know you're they're they're the out they're. they're they're a business and they're designed to, 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 for, you know, you are the product or you are the target. I forget You're exactly, target. but, but you, you know, the they're, yeah. they're, they're, you're the, yeah. And, and, and there's so much power and there's so much benefit, just like you're describing. I found the same exact thing. It's so cool for me. You know, I connected with Phoebe Russell over social media and, and then we chatted for my podcast and chatted off and on. And then to meet her in person for the first time in November, 2019, we just, we just, it was like, we just picked up a conversation that we'd been having. I felt like I'd known her for years and, and to meet people that interact with what you do and meet them in person, you know, you have this connection. It's amazing. So it's a, but it's tough because these platforms, if you're not careful, if I'm not careful, I find myself doom scrolling, you know, going through. And even though I've been doing, I've been doing this stuff for, for a long time. And I still am like, oh no, I only got X number of likes on that. You know, no, I, so I have to be really careful. That's why I'm saying we're all going to, like, it's easy to say, oh, don't care about the, like, actually, I stop to care about the following when I TikTok and I'm, I'm up there. I mean, I think like no one has, has few likes that I have. <laughs> Than me on TikTok. <laughs> I mean, I post I post many different things. Um, I post like me playing piano, me playing double bass, me with playing with Bojo, me playing with uh, other people like Hugh Kluger. He's a sub principal of the Philharmonic, London Philharmonic. We have like 30 view, 40 view, I think maybe three likes. And I post one video of my electric car charger in front of my flat that is kind of noisy, 51,000 view. And then I post like. <laughs> I post like a video of my washing machine doing salsa rhythm, which I thought was kind of nice, but I mean, it's still my washing machine, you know. <laughs> Same, like so many of you, maybe less than my electric car machine, but still. Then I post again some a video of me playing 20 view. So, <laughs> I mean, if you start, <laughs> if, if you start like to think that the number of you reflects the quality of your playing, don't go on TikTok. I mean, <laughs> you know what I mean? Right, right. Yeah, that platform has been... <laughs> Oh, that platform has been particularly confusing for me. I actually started a TikTok for the company I work for, and I think I'm following you, actually. Um, I, although I don't think I saw that washing machine. Eastman Music Company is the company. But, um, yeah, I've been posting things, and I can feel uh, no effect. You know, I think it's a great platform, and Joe, uh, lots of people are doing good stuff on it. But I can kind of feel my brain rotting as I'm, like, trying to post and, and you know. <laughs> but um, how do you – just logistically speaking, so we have these – distraction platforms that are so beneficial but also can be a major distraction and then we have this deep work that we do as musicians getting better at pieces and working do you do you keep a schedule and i've struggled with this and tried different things myself do you say like oh from eight to noon, eight a.m to noon i'm only going to practice and then i'm going to do this like do you how do you do you organize your time in any way in terms of that you know all this book on my coach over there they're all like a uh, self-personal yep, yep. uh books like uh, so the first one is a power of habits the other one is smarter faster better i've got atomic habits as well somewhere so basically i'm trying to have a routine i'm trying very hard like i spend more time reading books about how to have a routine than actually
actually have a routine, but mm -hmm. the thing is for social media, my rule is not to spend more than one hour a day. I can mm -hmm. tell you, I never follow my rule. I follow, you know what? I follow my rule <laughs> only the day I've seen a social dilemma. I try to not go on any screen for one day. I lasted four hours. <laughs> I was very proud. <laughs> 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 but anyway, what I'm saying is you should not spend more time posting things online than living your life. Like if you leave nothing, mm -hmm. if you don't time, don't take time for yourself, don't take time to practice, don't take time to actually live your life. What you're going to post is very, will be kind of superficial. You can actually, you, after all, everyone does what they want. I mean, I'm not judging. I'm just saying you should not be obsessed with it, which which is very hard. Not at the beginning, because at the beginning, like you, you don't really know how it works. You it's not a habit i will say that don't be obsessed with it in in a good and in a bad way because sometimes i've got like video who works very well and i'm so excited about it and a friend who have no social media who told me this is not healthy like you can't be so excited because you've got like so many views on one video what's going to happen when no one is going to see some so i'm i'm trying to I have a new thing uh do you know mel robbins i know the no she's an american speaker that has uh, that did her something called the five second rule it's all about how to reset yourself yeah. it's like a mindset thing and she's uh, once i've seen one of our videos that she said you should not go on a screen at least 30 minutes after you woke up like don't use your phone as a wake-up alarm mm -hmm. and for 30 minutes don't go on your screen don't check your email don't check your social media just have your breakfast brush your teeth uh, plan your day and then open your phone and this 30 minutes that you plan your day without any distraction without any adrenaline notification you know gonna help you to actually keep track of your day and it's actually Mm -hmm. it's really working like really like it's insane to see how 30 minutes when you wake up can make a change in your day because then even if you go on the screen even if you lose a bit of time on social media like everyone or youtube or, or tiktok oh my god i'm like i'm ver i'm so not i'm so not popular on tiktok but i enjoy watching videos so much like there are some cooking accounts that absolutely are absolutely amazing i feel like i gain 10 kilos just by watching the video but i <laughs> it's amazing but what I'm saying is if you have this thing that uh, you're 30 minutes in the morning that you you know what you have to achieve in your day then you're not that distracted you you watch your cat video on YouTube but you know that you have to um, do this or, or you get to do that the thing I changed as well is I used to always say oh I have to I have to finish this piece or oh, I have to learn this by memory for tomorrow or oh, I have to answer to this person now I try to change by I get to know this piece for tomorrow I get to to play for this this concert i get to talk to this person and it changed the whole way your your day is going i i had to learn a lot about that kind of thing because i wanted to trick my students i never been a huge fan of practice i always practice last minute and when i was a child i always i was doing a lot of things i was doing jazz i did a lot of uh, jazz concert between my 11 and 15 actually my biggest concert in my life i did it before was between my 11 and my 15 years old because i was wow. do you know a vi jazz violin is called did yellow quid uh, I so he's a friend yeah. he used to um, discover me when I was 10 and he brought me like to do some concert with him just not just me me and four other um, child to promote his school we used to do his first part of concert sometimes so I until I was 15 I thought like every musician in the world were rich famous and their only problem is oh this venue is is um, booked for September we need to find another venue that was I thought that was the main problem of musician but what I'm saying is because I was doing jazz, I was doing double bass, I was doing piano, and I had school and things like this, I always managed to, and I hated to practice, I had to be efficient. But the problem is now I have to convince my students that practicing is actually enjoyable, it's very nice, it's a nice journey. Even so, I still struggle a lot like to really practice um, at reasonable time for a reasonable time, you know what I mean? So I read all yeah. this book to kind of find a way to trick them into practice. <laughs> And now it's actually helping me. <laughs> well, I'd, I'd love to know what, what either you do for yourself or I for started for my students and then I did it for myself because I felt a bit guilty to like teach something I was not doing. And they are not stupid. They could feel it. Yeah. And do you have this thing? Have, there yeah. is something very strange. I don't know if it happened to you, you need to tell me. When I start to really practice for myself, when I, like, for example, I have a concert, I need to finish like two different programs. So I start to really, really practice hard because I don't practice regularly, but when I practice, I, I do practice. And actually that the same moment when I have that kind of week that I really had to practice like a lot, um, suddenly all my students did practice as well. Like, I don't know how, it's like if mm -hmm. 
I, I do. You're walking the walk. You're living. You're living. You're li living what you're. You're pr practicing what you preach, R right? And even if you aren't making it explicit, they're probably it's rubbing off on yeah, them. It's strange, no? Sometimes I like. I, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I feel like so. I realize that first I uh, I'm not good in lying, and then I don't want to pretend to them because it's a conversation. You know what I mean? I uh, I don't want to pretend mm -hmm. that I do things if I don't. And so and after telling them, oh, you need to do that. You should do that. Oh, it's so fun to do that. I mean, then I try for myself. And oh, actually, <laughs> that was a good advice. <laughs> well done, me. <laughs> Yeah, I think students have a ha, can can tell can sniff out authenticity or not. And even if like like I so I was a high school orchestra teacher for seven years, um, and I uh, went through phases where I would have concerts. I I like you, especially during that time. I would own. I, I it was really hard to motivate myself to practice. But when I did, when I had a concert or something like that, my I know my teaching was better, and I know that I was like hearing things differently because I had I was spending more time on the instrument. And it's not like I was bad when I wasn't taking that time, but like my brain was on a different wavelength then. And and part of it, frankly, was just sitting in the bass section for me and listening to the conductor and being part of the ensemble and I think the same is true for practicing like with my whopping two students I have now I have gotten I have tricked myself through Atomic Habits actually I love that book and other books into uh, I have I, I don't practice that much but I practice consistently and it's paid off I my wife even came out the other day and she's like I don't want to <laughs> act like I'm spying on you so to take this is the right way but you sound a, like a lot better or good or I don't remember what she said exactly and I'm thinking well you know I've just been c consistent and I think that's rubbed off on my couple students and I have never, I don't know how you are, but I have never been a teacher who's good at telling students to practice at like making them practice. I don't think I've, I think I tried to back 20 years ago when I was teaching and I realized, and, 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 and the, the more I've taught and the more experience I've gotten, the more I've tried to like, I guess maybe trick them into practicing like through maybe through my enthusiasm or through giving an example, but I can't make them practice. I, I Jason Heath can't, maybe someone can through fear or intimidation or whatever, but I'm not a, I'm not a scary teacher <laughs> and I don't think anybody's been intimidated by me ever. And I've never wanted to. And, and I don't think that is great motivation either. So it's, uh, yeah, maybe it's that, that, I don't know, developing intrinsic motivation, which is a really tricky thing. Yeah, I think that's I maybe that what it me, is. For example, I practice when I know I'm going to play for people, when I know that what I'm doing mm -hmm. by myself will be exposed. Like I, I, I live to perform. Mm -hmm. Like I live for mm -hmm. it. Maybe it's my huge ego. I don't know, but I, I like people <laughs> listening to me. <laughs> And so if I, and that's a good thing about social media, for example, you have an audience next to your mm -hmm. phone, um, all for run through as, as well. It's very good. If you have a concert and you need to do a run through, I can tell you mm -hmm. that playing live on Instagram, when you can't see the audience, when you can see this little hurt or, or you don't know actually if it's hurt, maybe it could be people saying, I can't hear you. I can't hear you, but you don't know. And you see your screen. Like, how do you say when it does this, uh, palpiting? I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Like uh, why you or kind of, yeah. Like you're up for a huge stage fright in your living room, but that's the best way to rehearse before a concert. So that's one of the, one of the, mm -hmm. the good thing about social media, like doing run through it whenever you want, you just mm -hmm. plug your phone and go for it. But yeah, what I, if I, if I don't have a deadline, I'm not that kind of person who enjoy practice just to practice. Like I never been like this. And so what I do with my students, for example, is I trick them. I don't say practice. I trick them into wanting to achieve something uh, for themselves first. I always say like, don't do it for me. Like, I don't um, Actually, I'm not that, I'm not that nice because <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. And actually I'm very surprised. You know, I'm amazed that my, my students still likes me sometimes. I, I, I really admire them because I'm not that nice. But what I tell them is like, they do it for themselves. They just have to know that if I'm, if I'm bored during a lesson, I'm, I, I may not want to teach them anymore because that's if they are bored, I understand, but I don't want to be bored like i'm too selfish for this but what i'm saying is like um we do little like i make sure they want to achieve something 
they want to make beauty in what they do, like by the sound, focusing on the sound. I, I really think that either piano or double bass, especially double bass, if you have a crappy sound, there is you can have a fantastic intonation, you can like play many pieces if your sound is bad, if you don't know anything about phrasing, if you don't know where is going the melody, um, you can't enjoy. And, and your neighbor can't enjoy for sure, but I mean, even you... <laughs> When you, mm-hmm. when you play, when even you, yeah. like, when you play, how can you want, like, how do you want to practice if every time you touch the instrument, there is a cat sound going out of it? I mean, so that's the first thing I do, like, we practice on sound and on double bass, it's so nice because it's imp- like, you can see the difference between, you can hear straight away the difference if you put work in it, like, if you actually feel the movement, if you feel the string, if you feel the bow, I'm sorry, I'm like uh, making all the gestures at the same time. <laughs> I'm like a Muppet. <laughs> but on piano it's a bit harder because when you when you do one note you have the sound so for a beginner you think oh it's easier but actually you don't see straight away what's the difference between a good sound or a bad sound on piano because beginner thinks that you just have to press the key and voila. But on double bass, I mean, if you don't have a minimum of focus on sound, there is no way to enjoy. So that's the first step I will say to make them practice, improve the sound. And that's something that this Zoom teaching world we're yeah. currently in, as we're chatting, I find particularly frustrating, right? You know, the, the, um, it's always struck me as, as so interesting how, you know, because I mean, I get how different bass, the, you know, there, there's that organic quality of you're holding the bass with your hands, and particularly your left hand is actually, you know, the, the conduit between string and fingerboard, and the bow, you know, you're, you're getting in there and like kneading clay. And piano, it's, it's always so fascinating to me how different somebody's sound can be on piano. And I think, wait a minute. This is this thing the 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 instruments making the sound I, like I just it's it's remarkable to me how different pianists can sound uh, given that just the the difference in interaction between strings and and keyboard yeah, you want to know be... now or is it like a retro ah. <laughs> uh, first i would love to, to know i would love to know like, please uh, <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what time is it for my neighbor but like for example if you if you just like hit the piano like a like a hammer i don't know if we can hear with the microphone so um like for example if i just hit mm-hmm. without being careful yeah. just like it's like three notes, no interest at all. It's like a random sound. Now, if I just, mm-hmm. wait, if I just like, if I want like um, a round sound, you know, like with projection, but something very tender. And and if you want like, wow. like I don't know, something a bit, you can balance differently as well because you have three notes. It's not the same to have like this, or this, or this. It's like so many things like this. It's like the movement you can change if you play with your if you play with your arm. It's a it's exactly the same than bass actually. If you play with your arm, it's not the same sound. That if you play with your wrist, not the same sound. That if you just play with your finger, not the same sound. Like if you if you listen to the bass or if you listen to the high register, it's even another sound. If you play with someone else and you try to mix your sound with with the other person, it's it's a different sound depending on if you play Rachmaninoff or if you play Debussy. Like um, like for example, if you play Debussy, you will like something very smooth, like just colors. Imagine the same sentence as like Rachmaninoff will be more like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's a way you mm-hmm. it's a way you link not together, but it, you actually can like you have so many colors in one knot. It just depends on how you eat the knot. The difference is that if you just like play with your elbow, and so I feel so bad for my neighbors right now. <laughs> Uh, if you if you just play for your, with your elbow, <laughs> you will have a sound. <laughs> Try to play with your elbow on double bases. <laughs> it's a bit different. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's got to, it's got to be so, and it's 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 incredible how what a difference I can hear even through like the the mic on your on your headset. I imagine you know I'm hearing those those balance differences and everything. So like, it, it, you know, it'll be even more uh, the contrast will be even more apparent in person. It's it's got to it's got to be really interesting thinking about weight in terms of bass and weight in terms of piano. That it's got. You, uh, like, you know, so many people ask me like, how come do you play two instruments? Doesn't mean you have to practice twice. I think because I play two instruments, I don't have to practice as much. In a way that, you know, on bass, you learn to hold the sound. You need to, 
you need mm-hmm. to take care of your sound until the end. You know, if you have a, um, a long knot, you really need to work for this knot. You need to take care of it until the end. You need to listen to it, make sure you don't speed your bow, make sure you don't slow your bow, make sure your vibrato is fine. So you are, you you train to listen until the end. Really, whether it's on piano, when you play a long knot, physically you do nothing with your ear. You should listen and you really should listen to this sound turning at the end but but physically you do nothing and by playing long note on double bass it teach me how to listen on piano to the note and have like more expression and and to develop a different way to play that actually serves me a lot that many pianists take a lot of years to learn how to listen properly but for me it's just instinctive because I, I learn it playing bass or on bass it's like how to phrase a melody or how to practice I learn it with piano like counting out loud or singing the phrase before to play intonation easy I just play on like I've got perfect pitch which is by the way completely useless because my perfect pitch is French so it's 442 every single piano in UK is tuned in 440 which means I play everything if I play just with my perfect pitch I play everything too high like everything is too sharp so it's I can tell you perfect pitch is useless (laughs) that's so interesting you know i was just watching last night adam neely this wonderful youtuber i don't know if you've checked him out he's he's a bassist he's an electric bassist um but but covers like music theory and all that sort of thing and he went deep into perfect pitch and how it's um kind of along the lines of what you're describing how it's uh, it's also he was saying uh an astonishing percentage of people with perfect pitch lose it as they age there's like a certain like by the time you're 60 years old i don't remember the percentage exactly but it's 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 incredible what a drop and not only there, I've got perfect pitch, so but I've got this I, thing. Yeah. I thought everyone had this, and I discovered recently that actually, no, I've got the kind of, you know, what is synesthesia? Uh, I see the, I see, yes, yes, less, absolutely, I see but the describe it. Yeah. when I talk or when I hear sound. Funny enough, not when someone is singing. When someone is singing, mm-hmm. I don't have, I don't have this, but with music, if I, or when I talk, for example, I just say the word tall, and in front of my eyes, I can see the T, the A, the L, the K, which means that when I can't imagine how a word it's spelled I can't say it I don't know how to pronounce or I don't know how to, which sound to use and with my perfect pitch that's why for example um I don't like so much orchestra because it's too overwhelming for me because I can hear my part and I, it's very hard for me to mix uh, so many s- phrases together. It's like my brain is like, and I, I have to focus. Like it's it's getting better and I learn how to wow. focus and how to relax to not have this. But that's why like I know so people, so many people like saying like, oh, you're lucky you've got perfect pitch or oh, I wish I had perfect pitch, but it's useless. Like it's make you play out of tune when you could just let me and to what is around you like it's it's useful only when you got oral test like for for school but believe me life is not mm-hmm. school <laughs> well right well you, you're reminding me of an, of, of an oboe player i went to school with back a while ago at this point uh, in in chicago at northwestern and i and ha- he had perfect pitch and i remember i was in ear training with him and i would marvel at that and then we get to orchestra and i'd think boy for a person who has perfect pitch he sure plays out of tune all the time and it, you know it, I, it's so it's so interesting to me how how different uh, we we're all humans, but how different we can experience the world or music. Or I had a colleague who uh, was a bassist, but also a conductor, a wonderful conductor, and he lo- he got a virus that or the doctors aren't sure what happened, but he lost the hearing in one of his ears in the in a matter of hours. He went from being fine to uh, almost hundred percent hearing loss in one ear, and he. Lo- yeah, for life. It happened. Uh, it's never come back. And he, so that's scary. Um, but he 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 lost the ability to conduct for a while. I mean, he regained it, but it totally changed how he heard everything. All of a sudden he was on the podium and he couldn't hear like and it wasn't that he could just hear half the orchestra, not the other half. He was hearing like weird things pop out like he could hear like second oboe overwhelmingly, but he couldn't hear like the violins in front of him. And it, it's just so incredible how how differently uh, uh, we can Sir experience. Roger we can experience um, the world. 
he has his thing as well. Like uh, it's a different, it's a, for a different reason. But he has one ear that doesn't work, and he has a fake ear at, instead. And I, I remember that every time. So he, when I was in Royal mm. College, I had to change to like uh, play in orchestra with um, Sarah John Norrington, Ashkenazi, uh, Bernard Hating, like so many great uh, conductor, which was amazing to to learn. And I remember that uh, Sarah Norrington was like my my favorite one. Every time I went to talk to him, of course I always talk to him to the wrong ear of course because it's me <laughs> so I, I could like talk to him oh. and be a bit shy and, and right, say right. how lucky like how I felt so lucky to play with him and, and 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 then he was scared because he didn't realize I was here because I was like next to him and uh, and so many times it happened uh, yeah the, the, sorry I was just it just represent me like how clumsy I can be but yeah yeah it's one of my worst nightmare actually to it's what... lose um Two things to lose my my ears not ears how do you say in english and to lose my hearing or the other yeah, thing hear, as well, i will not yeah. want to have and many musicians get them and i'm a bit scared of it is and uh, you know when you hear this sound it's, it's Oh, tinnit- tinnitus, a tinnitus, or t- I forget how you pronounce it, but yeah, where you have that ringing in your ears. Yeah, yeah, I want no part of that. <laughs> I'd rather, I'd rather probably, well, I don't know if I'd rather no, lose my ear I'm get that. I'd rather like, have neither of them also. Who actually got that kind of thing, how they're like, get so strong to fight this and find a way to still continue to play or still continue to listen or conduct like Imagine conducting it, like, you know, when you have this bad headphone that doesn't work and so you can hear only the left side, like, I can imagine how it should be, like, um, I'm very impressed, actually, like, I just wanted to say that. <laughs> yeah. Well, well Nor- Norrington, you know, the, the, con- the effect a conductor can have an ensemble is even more baffling, if you think about it, because they're just, like, waving their arms and and coaching essentially what uh, uh what uh norrington uh what what's what because they're in rehearsal one of your favorite people music work with? no because music that's kind of, kind of a tough was question but, his yeah. main focus during rehearsal you know what i mean every phrase he wanted to explain it, why mm-hmm. he wanted like this mm-hmm. the sound the balance it was very specific it's funny is that the thing he had only one here, but he was so specific about balance and, and the, the, his enthusiasm as well. Like the way he was explaining everything with a big smile. The man was dancing on the on the podium. I mean, he's a certain age now and uh, could be a bit scary sometimes. But, <laughs> but it was so inspiring. And, you know, like he had this enthusiasm. When you looked at him, you could, I mean, close your eyes and you could imagine that he's someone that just started music and was so happy to be here. You know what I mean? Like he was uh, preserved mm-hmm. from all this mm-hmm. angriness and frustrations that some people get after a few years in the industry. He was still a child and I really like this, a very interesting child. Mm-hmm. And that's what fascinated me the most about him. And the fact that Again, sound and balance and quality of phrase was his main focus. That's something very important to me. That's why, for example, I never wanted to be a um, mm-hmm. double bassist in orchestra. I've been criticized a lot for this because I say like, oh, you should not. What do you want to do if you're a bassist that doesn't want to play in an orchestra? But I, I really never wanted to because yeah, it's nice if you play like for people like Norrington. But I find it hard to play with the same people all the time even so it's always a nice community it's always nice to like build music mm-hmm. all together i find it fantastic like very enrich- enriching you say like this enriching mm-hmm. like you know what i mean inspiring but but at the same time yeah yeah when you sit yes, during exactly. rehearsal with a conductor you don't like and you have to follow his musical ideas and and, and you it's very rare honestly when you like someone you can't like everything about someone you always have different opinion like it it doesn't mean the conductor is bad it's just you don't have the same opinion i find it very hard to spend three hours a day rehearsing a piece played in a way that you don't really feel like it i find it a bit frustrating Yeah. Well, it's such a different way of existing in music than what we've been talking about. You know, and I, I enjoy playing orchestra. Okay. We have a lot in common in terms of this. I enjoy playing it occasionally. I, it's like the, well, this year has been weird, but <laughs> because there's been nothing, but if we think, if we pretend this year didn't happen, uh, I've, I've, 
sub maybe once a once a month once every couple of months sub a week in the san francisco symphony and that is like a great amount because i get a pop in work with good artists and if it's a and even at the top level group whatever group you're talking about there's no, even, even like fantastic not everybody's norrington like right <laughs> or boulez who i always enjoyed working things with and maybe my way to see things is very bad usually my way it's yeah it's not bad but it's it's not the best but it's my way you know what i mean it's the same way that when you play in chamber music, you will not impose your ideas. You will, it's a, it's a, it's a talk, it's a conversation, it's, but it's hard to have a conversation with 100 people. Okay. So of course it's final word is from the conductor and it's normal and it should be like this, but I'm lucky enough that because I play two instruments and I've been lucky to be able like to record on double bass, for example, or to do chamber music a lot on piano, a bit on double bass, I have choice. So sometimes I like to play in orchestra because I really like this idea to that so many people are aiming for one goal to make one piece beautiful i find it very nice but mm -hmm. i'm lucky that i can choose you know what i mean and i think people should know that they can choose yeah the, yeah the spectacle of it is is sort of fun and being one of a hundred and this and i always enjoy when you see a great conductor the, just the puzzle solving process of like how do we get from rehearsal one to the finished product but you know there's it's so much more possible this is sort of my my takeaway from a whole bunch of podcasts and chatting with people um people think oh you're a bass player oh you're gonna play orchestra great or maybe you're gonna play jazz or that's it, you know, or maybe teach university. There is, it is so much more possible to do so many other things than people realize. That's kind of maybe my takeaway. And I've re and, and you can kind of do, this is a real generalization, but you can kind of do whatever you want. And if you're passionate and you, and you're persistent and you knock on the right doors and you take the sort of attitude, like we've been talking about, you'd be amazed what kind of a career no, you but it's still possible. Uh, during a pandemic, maybe it's a little harder, but it's, but you know, my friend Nick Ville, <laughs> it still is possible. Nick, Nick, I could name a million examples, not a million. I could name many examples, but I like, like I'll na name just a couple. Like Nick Villalobos plays in a group called Simply Three. They got started there in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, you know, Southwestern United States. And they just started recording covers on violin, cello, and bass of pop songs. And they have a, that's their full-time job. They made a total career out of doing that. They've got, you know, they've got many videos that have, you you know, into the like 10 million views for some covers and, and they built a career out of it. Um, we could take uh, uh, Louis Levitt in Sybarite 5 in New York City, chamber music, string quintet, that playing music written exclusively for them. And and that that has been their career for the last eight, nine years. And I could name so many other examples, but it's, it is possible to, I mean, th that's so specific, right? I'm a double bass player. Okay, well, you don't use that in chamber music maybe so much anyway. We're going to play quintets, but we're only going to play quintets that are composed for us. And we're going to somehow to make a career out of it. And they did. How'd they do it? By being persistent, by showing up, by working as a group, by being creative, by putting in the time, building up social media. You know, it's incredible what you can do. It's so much more possible well, the than thing, I don't know orchestra, why, jazz, but university people teaching. People like always place the bass as a back instrument, like the thing to just support, but not as a solo instrument. Mm -hmm. And that, for example, social media, fantastic for this. You have so many good best players that actually play by themselves and prove that it can be fantastic in solo. And, you know, before when a double bass player was like a bassist, like or a musician was like playing solo, it used to be like a kind of a circus exploit. You know what I mean? Like it, it was like virtuoso thing. And we were, they were all applauding because, oh my God, technically it's very hard and all oh, that, but you will not listen to it in your living room in the background of a dinner. But now I find with time, I find there are more and more real musician, real double bass player, musician. I insist on double bass player, musician, because there are many players, any instrument that's not necessarily musician. So double bass player, musician that plays solo and it's beautiful and you will listen to it and you will not think, oh my God, that's how does it does it? Like, it's very good for double bass. No, you say it's very good. 
and you don't have to add for database anymore. And that changed a lot. I think with young generations, they're getting better and better. Like last time on Instagram, I um, I found this profile. Her name is, do you know, Sasha, I think you pronounce it, Vilden, Vilden. She's a young database, blonde database. Oh, oh my God, yeah. she was I playing. Think I, I'm pretty sure I've had her on the podcast, actually. I've yeah, she's young, before. right? I um, fall completely well, in love I, I, with I, her playing. Like she's amazing. She has already everything yeah. like in my, for my test, mm-hmm. like at least for this piece, she was like absolutely mm-hmm. mind blowing. And there are so many more. And you know, I found her, do you know this account on Instagram called Basis mm-hmm. with Boobs? Yes. And it's uh, an account that promotes. Yeah, like, um, yeah, I, 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 I do. Uh, you found her on there? That's, that's many great. Many girls can play double yeah. bass. And because that one thing as well is like, not only the mm-hmm. base world is changing, the technique is changing, the repertoire is changing. Mm-hmm. They don't play uh, anymore just uh, Dietersdorf, uh, Hotzmeister, and uh, the Dragon AP and Botezini, but now it's like expand because the technique change, evolve, the quality of teaching change as well. The quality of double base string, everything change, evolve, improved. So the I lost track of my thought again. <laughs> No, yes. Uh, the thing is, like, the, the uh, view on we're talking on about promo- promoting well, female basis like and Sasha and like, uh, no, it's yeah. not used to be for men. People thought it used to be for men. I remember, and I remember when I was a child and I was doing all this content with Didier Lockwood. He always put, right. he always always put emphasis on the fact that I was a girl playing the double bass because it used to be something not very common. And now there are so many of us everywhere. <laughs> and I like this that everything is changing, not just not just the world in general but the world like of music the world of double bass like i'm sorry it doesn't make so much sense uh, it's very blurry when i'm saying <laughs> no 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 it makes a hundred and you're hitting on so many th- topics that i uh, have come up you know certainly on the podcast but other places as well it's it's interesting to me i'm 44 so i've been teaching bass 20 some years or something like that and and if i go back 20 years ago uh, what i noticed and i was teaching in chicago at the time i and i was teaching in all these different high schools i found it was either it was either all guys or if there were female bass players it was about 50 50 so it's like as long as there was one model like oh she plays bass oh i can play bass oh it's possible and so um and 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 when i've i, I was up in portland oregon a few years ago and nina de caesar who's now in the baltimore symphony she was uh, in the oregon symphony and i gotta work with some of her students she has great students male and female but you know there the, uh, it, it's it seems that uh, here in the states at least and it's it's regional for sure but especially if if there are a few female basis it quickly becomes like 50 percent this is not an, a scientific poll but that's about what i've found and um one of the things that we that we're certainly seeing here in the states is a major drop off if you look at 18 and under uh, and again, this is not scientific, but there are some people in the International Society bases that have looked at this. It's getting a lot closer to 50-50. Um, but a lot of female bases are not choosing to pursue bass in college. And, and then there's another... Now, it just drops from 50. I don't remember exactly. And then if you look at the profession, if we're just thinking orchestra here, um, if you look at the professional orchestral world, it's a really small percentage in the United States. Although with some notable exceptions in the Minnesota orchestra here, the principal and assistant principal, uh, Kristen Bruya and Kate Nettleman, both, both female. So um, here in the San Francisco symphony, uh, we've had a female basis for a long time, obviously Oren O'Brien. So there are exceptions, but it's a, the the tide is turning. I, I, one, one quick analysis. My wife is a radiologist, and if we go back 25 years, it was almost exclusively male. And now the f- the field is it is 50-50. The attending, you know, everybody her age, it's it's 50-50. Now, if we go to the att- the older generation that are still employed, maybe around 60, that is still like 90% male. But that's changing. So. I'm from my on scientific perch. I'm definitely seeing that change happen, at least here in the United States. What What's your experience been like, either in France or your experience in the UK no, in so terms of that in France, ratio? Uh, when I started, I was the only girl um, playing the bass for a long time, mm. and then when I was mm-hmm. like 15, 16, it started to be more girl. And in college, we were not that much. In Royal College, we were like, at the beginning, we were like maybe two or three. And then I think now it should be half and half. And I, um, 
No, in, in France, they were more worried about the fact that I played two instruments that didn't really like it. That's why I came to UK. In France, if you do mm. too many things, no, if you do more than one thing, I generalize, of course, it's not the way like this everywhere, but I'm just saying as a general idea. Right. In France, if you do more than one thing, that means you're dilettante, that means you're not very committed in what you're doing, that means you're not serious, you can't be serious, it doesn't matter. I remember when I when I called, uh, I was 19 or 18, and I called the... Uh, Paris Conservatory because I wanted to audition for both for piano and uh, and double bass and <laughs> the secretary she yelled at me saying like what what do you mean you want to do both I say yeah I want to apply for both she say my lady I don't know how what will be the right trans- like a girl be committed in one thing and call me back when you know which one so wow. I studied at the Ecole Normale <laughs> which is a private school in in Paris that's a superior school you know but it's for soloists and it's private so I went from this and then I went mm-hmm. to Royal College because they were very happy they were the only ones that, in, that I knew that were offering like a syllabus for two instruments like I could have two diploma for each instrument two bachelor two masters for the same price and one which is important mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Double lesson for the same price in one. <laughs> yeah, for sure. That's great. <laughs> oh, but that's in your case. I mean, uh, of course, and in US, I guess it's even more important. But <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Our system. Well, the UK and the US share a lot in common in terms of I can see that open that sort of Wild West mentality of you know try trying f- things out. Yeah, but it's even no, worse. No, but, I mean, co- college no to, uh, costs are US. even I'm like more complex here. Some things that you, sure. you will be so happy about. But what I'm saying is like when I arrive in the UK, they thought <laughs> that the fact that I played two instruments was my strength was like a very good thing. That was the first time that no one was. Quick questioning what I was doing, who I was, because I was playing two instruments. And for this, I'm very grateful. I mean, of course, it's it's not a perfect school. The way, no school is perfect. But for this, I will be always grateful that they, they make me feel like I belong in two instruments, that I didn't have to choose that for the first time in my whole life, I was not bullied for playing two things like, like or not undermined because I was playing two instruments. And when I was playing jazz and classical, I don't want to like it was even worse. I was playing jazz only on double bass. I'm a terrible jazz player on, on piano. But the the fight between classical music and jazz was even bigger. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say here is like for everyone, don't really listen what people think. Like if you feel that you want to do something, if you're committed to do it, if you're ready to fail, which is a good thing. And people will people who don't fail are people who don't try. Like you have to fail and you will fail. But you need to commit, you need to be committed committed to do what you want but you need to do what you want and stop to listen to people there are always going to be people saying you can't do it you should not you should not do it it doesn't exist like everyone were telling me like oh but you can't play you can't be professional in two instruments that doesn't exist like it will be half a career which may be going to be true maybe i will have half a career but i'm happy with my half i mean it's a good half <laughs> This episode is brought to you by Dorico, the advanced music notation software from Steinberg. And one of the things that is a very intentional decision, but also a little perplexing if you're coming from other pieces of software, is that when you start, there's no time signature. It's just a single quarter rest. That opens the door for so much creativity. And here is Daniel Spreadbury, senior product manager of Dorico, on why they made that design decision. We really wanted to to make it clear that when you start a piece of music in Dorico, it's really like starting from a blank piece of paper. No matter how true that really is in Sibelius and Finale, because of course you can change all those things, sometimes at a cost. You know, if you've already written some music in Finale and then you change the time signature, you can have a lot of ties and all sorts of other stuff to clean up, which you won't have in Dorico. But it's just that that kind of hopefully inviting. I mean, some people might say, oh, it's a bit daunting. There's literally nothing there but one quarter rest. I've got to decide everything. But yes, you do. You're the creative person. You do have to decide everything. This is one of the many design decisions that I think is totally brilliant in Dorico. It has opened the door for my own personal creativity, and it's such a beautiful product. I can't say enough good things about it. I use it every single day. There is a free version, Dorico SE, that gives you practically all the options that the full version of Dorico gives you up to two stabs. So if you're doing bass duets or any kind of duets like that or exercises, that's more than enough. Dorka.com will take you to their page on Steinberg's website. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. 
My daily companion for practicing is the app Modacity. I love it so much. And the interface is so simple. You open it up and you see a microphone and a timer. And here is Modacity founder Mark Gelfel on why you see that in the interface. It comes down to practice efficiency. And practice efficiency, the way that I think about it, is an equation with three different variables. One of them is learning milestones, one of them is retention, and the other is time. I define practice efficiency as learning milestones times retention divided by time spent. Modacity has helped my practicing so much and so many other people I know. You can learn more at modacity.co and visit our site for a special offer on lifetime access to this app. Thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast, Modacity. Yeah, no, the, the combination, there, there's, a, there's a writer named Scott Adams who did the comic strip Dilbert for a long time and has done many other things. Um, it, uh, who, uh, but one of the things that he has talked about a lot is the, the difference, uh, and I, 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 I don't mean this in the wrong way, but that he's like, there's the difference between getting to 90, like 90 percentile in your career, in your field versus 99th percentile. So <laughs> if I use like a, I, w- I have to use a basketball analogy because I'm here in the United States, but if it's like the equivalent of playing on the Chicago Bulls versus being Michael Jordan, like it's hard to get on the Chicago Bulls, but to be Michael Jordan is like insane. And so Scott's thing is if you can get to that, n- that 90th percentile in a couple things, um, uh, uh, you're, 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 you've created a category for yourself. So, and, and, and that m- most people th- I'm generalizing here, but that that's a path towards success for a lot of people. Like for me, I'll just use me as an example. Like I'm an, I'm a fine bassist. I'm not even 90th percentile. I'm like, f- f- whatever. Um, and then I, I do public speaking and podcasting like that. And I'm not the best at this either, but I'm, I'm okay. I'm better at getting better and better. But by combining that and a couple other things, I've kind of created my own category and that's led to all sorts of opportunities so i think um one thing i love about what you're doing and you've got a lot of career ahead of you but you're providing an example of what someone you know that if we if we think about someone in your shoes who's maybe a few years younger who's in school who's maybe getting bullied whether it's in france or anywhere in the world um but they find you on instagram you're an example. That's the beautiful thing about the world we live in is that even if someone says no, they can say, ha ha, look at my phone. You're wrong. There are people doing this. So I think that that's one of the cool things about, uh, and again, we've talked about negatives, but that's one of the beautiful things about social media. I grew up in a really small town in the middle of the country. I can't say anything bad about it because my mom listens to the podcast and she'll, if I say anything bad about my hometown, she lets me know. So it's a wonderful place, South Dakota, but um, I didn't know it. You know, there was nobody <laughs> around. Um, and again, sorry, mom, I'm not not talking smack about South Dakota, but uh, the, the, uh, if I had had that sort of access that people your students at this moment have, I mean, who knows what I would have done. I made these decisions to go where I went based on like reading a magazine article or talking to one random person. So um, you're, that's a very long way of saying, I think it's super cool how you're putting yourself out there in the public and providing an example for people who are trying to do that's something that maybe <laughs> others are telling them can't do. <laughs> but you know, no, I, yeah, inspiration in every, in every way, like that's the main thing we should get from social media. We should inspire mm-hmm. people, but we should get inspired by people as well. Mm-hmm. And in career as well, if you think you can inspire people, mm-hmm. if you think like playing the piano while juggling will be like fantastic for people and it makes you very happy. First, it has to make you happy because you will have to promote this juggling piano thing. First, if you're confident in yourself and you promote your ID, Mm-hmm. then go for it. Just be ready that maybe some people will not be so nice about the fact mm-hmm. you're jangling where when you play while you play the piano. Okay, but be ready to accept the fact that you will have to fight a lot to promote that kind of concept. But but do it. I mean don't don't stop just because someone say, oh yeah. I think it's a bad idea. And I don't know why so many people um quit so easily. Mm-hmm. I mean I know but uh I mm-hmm. yeah I f- yeah it's tough because those those barriers are there, and I, Valentina Chardelli, and I don't know if your paths have crossed at all, but but she and I have talked about this she, a bunch uh, of times. She was uh, studying she, in college. A wonderful Italian bassist. Uh, I think she might be in London right now, but well, so she's been on on a quest to get to to. Uh, bring the bass in the public's eye into more of a soloist role for years. And I remember uh, 
talking with I first met her in 2017 at the Braditage double bass competition which has also been an event that has been trying to that the folks that have won that have gotten concert gotten some good help in their career but Valentina you know it's just it's it's they're they're there's still roadblocks if you want to try to if we say play with an orchestra you know there's still a lot of people that you, you go in the you go backstage you don't see a lot of double bass players hanging on the on the walls you know in in the in the green room um but you know what valentina's doing or what what jeff has done with his competition and the people that have won or what i am what you're doing and i imagine you'll continue to do is you are providing, providing those examples so if those barriers are there that that's one thing but if those barriers are there and then there aren't any examples it's just so easy to get discouraged and i can't help i, I recently uh read or reread gary carr's uh biography autobiography life on the g-string and it got me thinking about what was it like in 1967 you know saying i'm going to be a bass soloist and everybody's saying you can't do that and he says i'm going to prove you wrong and it's and it's just with no social media nothing none of these tools it's just it's really interesting I mean, I always knew he was a pioneer and he's sh touched so many people's lives and I'm, I'm playing bass because of him and so many people are, but like, boy, it put me in, reading that book again, put me in his shoes and just thinking like, wow, that, you know, uh, there, there, were, he was, you know, the only people he could use as examples were dead, you know, like Kusevitsky or, or <laughs> Dragon Eddie or Bottazzini. Uh, so, so it's just, but he's, he has opened so many doors with the work he did going back half a century and then in these last couple of decades like we've been talking about now or especially the last decade there have been so much more so much more recognition so many more doors opening the power of social media to get what we're doing in front of people more easily than ever we don't have to get permission to play a concert at venue x y or z you know we, we can and 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 then we have this power when we have these followings like you're developing and phoebe and these other people we're talking about um to get concerts because you have an audience and people will come so it's it's just really it's interesting times i we're we're living in and it's just we've come a long way and 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, and, and but just having me, those like, examples, because, because I've got examples, I think it's just so critical. I, I realized that double bass could be more than I expected. First, when I went to college, I remember, like, so when I say college, I mean while College of Music. I remember there was this guy playing in his practice room. His name was, I don't know if you should know him, Rodrigo Moro Martin. So he's a Spanish double bass player, and he was in his second year uh, yes, of I know the name. Mm -hmm. And he was playing Frank Sonata, violin sonata on double mm -hmm. bass. It was playing so well, like musically, like it was amazing. I never heard someone play that kind of piece on double bass. And that's how I discovered that you could actually be so much more lyrical than I imagined. You could play so many more pieces than, than I imagined that I knew. And first I got inspired. So I got inspired by people I met over there. So Rodrigo, Rodrigo Moro Martin, there were another like a double bass player called Jim van der Spaar. He's in Switzerland now. Same, he was playing like with so much so many mm -hmm. colors and pieces that were supposed to be for violin and and pieces contemporary pieces as well i didn't know for double bass but like no one used to play and it's kind of opened my eyes on how double bass could be but and then when i went on instagram because i'm very bad with name for example i don't remember name i remember people's face I remember people's name when I met them or when I talked to them. Otherwise, mm -hmm. the name is kind of doesn't make sense for me until I actually use it, you know what I mean? And on Instagram, but Bojo Parajik, for example, mm -hmm. I was, mm -hmm. oh, you know, with Bojo, it was amazing because so I heard him play. I was impressed online. And when we had our first rehearsal in real, I kind of, I don't know, I expect it to be less good. You know, I thought like maybe with the video, it will improve the sound. And, and re I remember we were in, our fl in my flat, actually. I was exactly here mm -hmm. uh, while talking to you and he started to tune and I had this um, I can't believe he's going to listen to this but uh, hi Bojo he started to tune his bass and I had a little panic <laughs> attack because not only the sound was not 
was in the video but the sound was like oh my god like the projection the color everything was just tuning the bass huh? i'm not even talking about playing tuning the bass and then he did like i remember he was warming up doing bram sonata because he had to play it for a concert in manchester a few days after and i was freaking out on my on my piano stool thinking like how 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 he is gonna hate the way i play i mean why does he want to play with me it was so good and at the same time it was mind-blowing for me like i I discovered that, yeah, my sound actually was so bad. <laughs> I thought my sound was good, but when I heard this in real, like, my sound is bad, <laughs> and oh, my Boeing is bad, and oh, my God, I thought I was kind of good. But And, and it was so nice. No, it was so nice, because for me, that was like a kick, uh, kick in the bottom. <laughs> I don't know you say. It was like it inspired me so much. Suddenly, I knew. Uh, suddenly, I started to practice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. But this and the fact, and so then we play for the first rehearsal. It went well, and that's when I say like then we wanted to do a video, pro- a whole program. I think we're gonna have like one hour, one hour and a half of recording. And um, when the pandemic will be over, because we we could just rehearse for now. And every month he add like one piece to to the program, right. thinking hey we could play this, we could play that. Uh, <laughs> so if the pandemic is too long, the program will be too long <laughs> when we're gonna record. <laughs> but I remember that then he told me like. Oh. If I wanted to have a bit of time, he could like give me one lesson on double bass. And I was like, yeah, of course, I would be so happy. And I remember before I played double bass to him, he was like, oh, um, you're a very good bassist as well. Like, uh, it was not ecstatic. Like when he talks to me about, when he talked about me about how, how I play the piano, he has this big word, like uh, amazing and everything. When he talks about me, <laughs> about double bass, he's like, oh, she's quite good. She's, uh, you know, it's more restrained, but. Still, he was not saying I was bad. So we had this only <laughs> lesson. And for 45 minutes, my friend, he made me play open string. 45 minutes of open string. At the end, I was like, so you must think I'm so bad. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm supposed to be a professional. <laughs> And he was like, no, don't worry. And when you will get this, I will show you things for the lesson. It's just the little things, little things, 45 minutes, only open string. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. But, you know, that reminds me of talking to Matthew McDonald in the Berlin Phil. When he got there and he started to hear the way that they approached the string and that sort of that, 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 uh, uh, Berlin style, you know, that ger- German bow kind of kind of approach. He said he told me he just did exactly that. He got together. I think it was with a violist, if I'm remembering right. And all they did was set the bow on the open string and try to figure out how to really get that string moving. And I mean, it's one of those things you think like, wow, you got principal bass of Berlin Philharmonic and you're practicing open strings for like a long time, like days, you know, so it's, it's, uh, it seems the humbling is, or silly, the but sometimes it's, those are the things that, that, uh, can, can unlock. No left finger, <laughs> no left hand. Yeah. My sound improved instantly, like instantly, like <laughs> instant, when I understood one motion he was showing me, like it changed my whole way to play. And, you know, I record during the first lockdown, I record a piece, I record Après un rêve, d'après un rêve from Forêt. And I had to record in my flat with building nose around and I had no now I know more or less how to edit but when I record the piece um, I have no idea how to edit a recording like I didn't know how to cut which means every time there were like a nose outside I had to redo the whole thing and mm-hmm. and the thing is oh. it helped what he showed me with the bow helped me a lot because that means when I was changing when I was changing direction in the bow I didn't have this like very strong attack, these unwanted sounds that I used to have sometimes. And that's uh, only because of this that I could record the whole piece mm-hmm. after many, many tries. Huh? It was not my first recording. <laughs> I think I, I attempt to record wow. it at least 10 times because I did record the piano <laughs> part as well. So I need to synchro- Like it was very hard for me to actually wow. listen. At the beginning, I record the piano part and then the double bass part. And then I drop the idea, I record the double bass part and then I did the piano part on top of it because I, I can't feel free with something with a static thing playing with me but what I meant is like this 40 this 45 right. minutes of open string were very very bad for my ego I mean I felt a little bit humiliated but at the end it was a winning 
in my play it helps so much and I thank him for this but you have to imagine how it yeah. makes people humble. <laughs> yeah, yeah, those are the tough <laughs> lessons. It's it's so cool though because if you go back a few steps, like the reason that so you you the the connection with him came through social media, and then you started collaborating, and now that's that's had this positive effect on your musicianship, like you're describing. And I think do, I think you have that video out on your YouTube channel, if I remember correctly. For Abraham. The, yeah. the for one, yes, it's the only uh, double bass video I have on my YouTube channel. I started a YouTube channel first because everyone was asking, and then because you know, um, I record many different videos for people, but mm -hmm. they started to post it on YouTube when I thought well, it will be only for Instagram. Or I did some interviews that people use some two years ago. I did an episode for Abu Dhabi TV, it's like the second biggest Arabic uh, channel in the world, mm -hmm. and it was like 23 minutes about me so my ego was so happy <laughs> <laughs> but it was during this 23 minutes that i thought would be a documentary it was actually so there were three music video and one interview and some um, and they were following me in london but i thought it would be my real life but actually it was more like mini film like for example it was me in a dress gown walking in an empty park you know as i do <laughs> my, <laughs> as, as i do all the time <laughs> oh, oh it was it's like me thinking uh, on the table of a, in a coffee place, you know, it's bad. Mm -hmm. Or me walking with candle in my flat. I mean, of course, I use candle to to compose with my pencil. Right. The only thing, the only thing was missing was like the feather at the end. But so the music video, they were. I was very happy to do to do it, and it was fantastic. But the synchronization is absolutely awful, mm. which is or awful or because they are not used to classical music, it's a bit it's dangerous for epileptic people. <laughs> Like it changed, okay. okay. <laughs> it changed a lot, and I, I'm very glad I did. I know, but I'm making fun, but I'm very flattered I did this. I'm very glad that I could introduce. Uh, so the main episode was about I was playing double bass for 23 minutes, and the background music was me playing piano. But I'm so glad I could introduce double bass to the Arabic world because many of them didn't know about it. Oh, they knew about double bass, but not classical music. Like, mm -hmm. and they didn't know we could play solo on double bass, and that's an amazing opportunity I had. But some of these videos are the synchronization and even the way I play for some uh, were not fantastic. Some people repost it on YouTube. So every time you type my name, you have either, oh, one, one advice for social media. Don't think it's going to stay on social media. Like if one day, <laughs> if one day, for example, you record with a friend because you're very happy, because it's very nice, you record a video of you playing Hallelujah with, with a flute player and it's out of tune. It, you look like if you gain 20 kilo is one video, like the light is awful, everything is awful, but it was such a happy moment that you record it and you thought it will be just like a happy moment for your followers, you know, like, like a bonus thing. If you end up on YouTube and you can't delete the video and that's the first thing that appear in your name, be aware that this is a problem, you can't remove it. So always think before to record something because otherwise you're going to have a hallelujah video of you <laughs> as the first thing people will look for. It's funny, but but you may regret it later. And and I started the YouTube channel to have like video I was not too embarrassed about when people Google my name. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mm, got it. Okay. Okay. Well, it popped up for me. I'll, I'll make sure to link to link to that and obviously Instagram and everything. And it's, that's funny. Cause it's so, it, it's, it's such a different world. Someone growing up with, with, with that in mind has versus like, I, you know, I was started college in the mid nineties. Uh, there was no public, you know, if I record something with a friend, it was just going to sit on my recorder or my video camera or something like that. But it's, it's interesting how, um, yeah, you got to be kind of careful. <laughs> I mean, you don't want to get you don't want to get get so obsessed that you never put anything out because we can always polish things to perfection. But yeah, maybe if you have something that's that's pretty pretty uh, because you know suspect. we always like people always ask how you gain like how is it to gain followers. Like how do you how do you do to like have an audience on on social media? The thing no one talk about is like, what do you do when you actually start to have an audience? And that's something I wish I would have known before, which means at the beginning, you're very shy. You don't post too many things. Your first video, you feel like your heart is going to pop out of your body. Um, and it still does it actually until now, but it's, it's fine now. The problem is when you get used to post video 
and and you start to think like oh my god i didn't post anything since four days and people are asking for a video i will record something quickly and and it's fine it will be fine and you start to post things that you're not necessarily proud about i'm not saying i'm proud of every video but every video have meaning now which means sometimes i don't play very well but it's just to show how i practice and it's a work in progress video and there is something i want to share it's not i just post the video to post the video but when I started to gain like when I had I think 10,000 followers I thought like oh I need to continue to post uh, videos and they were working well and I knew that the bass video were working better than piano video and I started to like post all this very cheesy strange stuff just to post you know with no no meaning behind it nothing it was not funny <laughs> it was not necessarily very good it was not my best playing it was really a post to post and that's the thing you need to be careful one night I woke up like with anxiety anxiety attack but you know panic attack sorry and i started to delete oh, really? all the posts i was not proud of it <laughs> because i was like what did i do and that's the thing that's the tricky thing that's the thing people should know is like the problem is not to gain followers the problem is what do you do when you have some followers like how do you react what how do you regulate yourself to not be addicted to this like adrenaline you have like when you this award you get when you've got like a notification a like thing or a view thing or a dm message like you really need to be careful about it you should not get to the pressure of posting for posting it's an algorithm you can't your life can't be controlled by an algorithm and it's okay it's okay if you take time to do something and it's okay as well if you don't post something perfect it's like two sides of the you know of the coins like it's very hard to post something because as soon as you post something it doesn't belong to you anymore you have to know that it doesn't belong to you so when you post a practice video you may be like a bit ashamed like two days after thinking like oh what did i do no it, that's the way you played two days ago and it's nice and it's nice to know that people are not playing only like the way they play on concert to play like you play in concert that means there is a whole process of practicing improving even bound by is doing wrong notes even josh rebel is playing out of tune like at one point learning is as important that's what I'm trying to trick my students into is like you need to enjoy mm -hmm. the process of improving and people need to understand that it's not because one day they can't play a specific piece in tempo that they will not achieve this tempo later thinking oh by the way people stop to play everything fast and think that the tempo is the goal because everything everyone sorry can play fast absolutely everyone can play fast but not everyone can play well good like with good phrasing good sound so mm -hmm. focus first on the sound on phrasing on the musical ideas on dynamics on colors and then you improve the tempo but don't see the tempo as a main goal sorry that was my little gabby advice of the day <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, I love it. I love it. It's uh, yeah, it's a, it's a trap. It can really be a trap that, that, that desire to what once, once things are clicking, you know, you're like, Oh, I've got to, I got to feed the machine. I got to feed the algorithm. I learned some of those lessons back in, I started blogging in 2005, which is like a totally different landscape for that sort of stuff. And I remember getting obsessed. I was like re replying to comments. I mean, this is just like a different era for the internet and early social media. I had some, some things I put out blow. I, I had a, car catch fire and explode on the way back from a gig and that made me weirdly weirdly internet famous for a little while in the in in certain circles and so my, I, I was doing a lot of writing that was getting attention and and oh i was back and forth it was 10 p.m and i was commenting back and forth and na you know good comments nasty comments this and that and then trying and and it's it can be so uh and again because these platforms have their good and bad sides, it can really be easy to get pulled in and sucked in like that. And yeah, it is a problem. What, what do you do once you do get an audience? But if you, if you approach it as, you know, a learning process and a journey that we're on, or that you're on, and that you're on with the people that are following you, it's a, that's a healthy way to do it. I so changed the way I see things that, for example, in December, I had this, I wanted to get in control of something. You know, when you're like, freaking out for everything and you need to 
have the impression to control one thing. So I started to remove, I think I removed almost 600 of my followers because there is this new thing on Instagram that you can remove yourself followers. I removed the one that were creepy. I removed the one that always like posted very strange stuff. Then I started to to remove like, because I thought I started to like explore my some of my followers and I thought they were a bit racist or I started like to remove just to feel that really like build this community community sense that I was mm-hmm. I wanted to make my followers proud of me and I wanted to make them feel better the days they needed some music to learn something from me but I wanted to learn something from them as well and I wanted like to really build a, a relationship of course it's not you need to be careful you're not you don't want to share everything and you don't have to share everything with your followers but I wanted to have this very honest relationship that if they want to talk to me they can they don't have like to ask like like, uh, they don't have I don't know you know what I mean like is it just ask a question and I'm here I and I answer and but in order to do that I needed to kind of have the impression that I could control the spirit not who was following me but the atmosphere the mood of my community yeah well that's a great thing and that's a, that's a great thing to do and that's a tough thing to do because then that follower number goes down and no matter how healthy you are in your mental state it's kind of hard to like we did a similar thing um not exactly the same but a similar thing with our email list I mean, this email list we've had for a long time and a bunch of inactive people and so my business partner on multiple projects Trevor he said look I've been researching this we should just uh, call the email list from people that aren't active in a certain way and I've been doing this stuff for forever and I'm like Trevor we can't do that that number is going to go down no one even sees that number it's so different than Instagram but I log into my email client I was like oh but I don't want I don't want that number to go down uh, even though it, it, it's irrational but so we did it the number went down but of course now the open rate went way up. The engagement rate went way, way up. And I think that's a, such a such a great thing to do, uh, particularly something in public like that. Yeah, to clear out the the suspect folks and the creeps and the people making weird posts. And and that's that's, that's it great. Took that's me a, so that's a rough long job, and, you too. Know, I, I, but that was... Uh... <laughs> Like I was being blocked like for one day, I couldn't see any of my followers, wow. but I was persistent. And I kind of, the problem I will say with me is like I built myself on a no. Every time someone is saying no, I, I'm like a spoiled kid. I really want, when someone say no for something, uh, suddenly the thing I want, yeah, I want it even more. Like, so when Instagram blocked me for removing mm-hmm. followers, mm-hmm. I wanted to remove even more followers. Like, I was like, this became an obsession. I was like, no. <laughs> 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 but of course like I didn't want to offend people uh, I mean it's not it's really not who you were it's what you were doing yeah you got it the analogy I've heard a lot is that you think of it as it, like your you, Instagram or YouTube channel or blog or whatever we're talking about that's like your living room it's like someone coming and just like you know going to the bathroom in the middle of your living room that's I think a, when people meet leave mean or nasty remarks or something like that you know there's this at least in the circles I've traveled in it's there's this oh free speech i should be able to say whatever i want well not not really and we've tried we've tried as best as possible to to police that i had many more problems with that a decade ago i had some really scary stuff get po and you'd think double bass really who's freaking out so much but i had i had some like quasi death threat things i kid you not and it was the sort of point where my my wife saw these and she said is our address publicly available anywhere on these platforms, Jason? And, I, and so I, I have battled that enough. Um, it's actually been much more positive for me the last five years. Um, I think it's partly because of what I was doing, because I was writing these sort of quasi-controversial things about the music business. And now these days, I'm just talking talking to folks about bass and life. And so maybe I'm uh, part. That's part of it. But um, but yeah, it's it's uh, yeah, it's it's a trick. I can see it's an important thing to do. It's cool that you did that. It's annoying Instagram blocked you. I remember I was posting some photos for a sponsor and I hadn't posted in a while and I posted like 10 photos in a row and I got blocked. I was like, why? You know, but so it happens. <laughs> but, <laughs> no, I kind of understand. I imagine it's to make sure like if your account has been hacked, that the hacker yeah. can't remove everything. But still, it's yeah. a bit annoying. But there is one thing as well that people, I think it's changing now a little bit. But I remember when I started social media, media people were like be careful people online are not very nice uh, it can be dangerous mm-hmm. elsewhere be careful what you post no one told me that you could lose your real friend by starting social media because at the beginning i will tell you the only nasty comment i've got behind my 
back were not online, were like from people around me. Mm -hmm. And especially when mm -hmm. he started to work, like mm -hmm. I was not prepared to this at all. Now I take it as a compliment. I'm thinking at least now I have something maybe to make people a little bit jealous. Maybe I had nothing before. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting when you zoom. What's interesting when you zoom out? That can be so tough, though. You know, when you're getting that kind of feedback. The only reason I started doing anything online was because I had decided to stop playing bass gigs, stop playing freelance bass, and go back to school to be an orchestra teacher. And so all of a sudden, I didn't care what anybody thought about me. And I'd always been so concerned with, oh, I want to make sure I get these gigs. I want to stay on everybody's good side. I want to do everything like that. And then I thought, I'm going to do whatever I want. And I started writing all these crazy stories and doing all this. And it had the unintended effect. I thought I was just setting fire to my base career. I'm like, that's it. I'm done doing something else. What if I, if I zoom out uh, two, three years after doing that, all of a sudden I was getting better gigs. I, I got hired at, for all these things that I never got hired before. I got hired at DePaul University in Chicago, all because of what I was doing online. And that all had the net effect of actually giving me more opportunities, actually making me a better player. So by trying to, by going online and just being honest uh, about what I thought about things and just putting myself out there, um, it had the unintended effect of leveling up my base career, which I thought it was going to do the opposite. So, you know, and I had people say, some, one of my colleagues said, you're crazy for doing this because I was going into teaching. And they said, you're going to have, you're going to have a paper trail online. People are going to be able to look you up and find things. Um, so it was never a problem. It only made me more interesting to these people. So um, that, that, you know, it's, 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 you, you, again, having a model can help. And I didn't really have a model. I just decided to take a chance. But, but you think I, so many young musicians I know, or musicians at any point, you're just so concerned about what people think of you or think about you, or you're trying to fit in. And sometimes just, just being honest, being true to yourself. It's amazing what doors that can open up. The thing as well is like, sometimes people say, yeah, but people don't know you on social media. They know what you show, which is true, but in real life as well. And to be fair, like many of my friends, I mean, what I, I don't know if we can say friend. Many of people around me, they didn't like what I was doing, but to be fair, it's because they saw that online people like the way I played and were, mm -hmm. were like saying many good things about me. And they saw me for a long time not practicing playing Candy Crush. So I understand, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like all these yeah. things that people imagine and the reality sometimes can be so different. So to be fair, I understand their surprise. Like they knew I was playing yeah. well, but in their mind, I was a girl playing Candy Crush on our yeah. phone and and building lego or puzzle and reading so many different things like playing on the piano all the pieces i was not supposed to play or sometimes when people know too much is kind of but now yeah, i'm yeah, saying yeah. that i share everything now like i have no i have no complex anymore like uh, <laughs> if you see my first video on instagram i was putting a bit of makeup make sure my hair were not uh, was not too messy now i understand that it's no, I'm like this. I'm a French girl with messy, <laughs> curly hair. I don't wear very often makeup. Often I have over, uh, like I'm I'm not a style, stylish person. I used to be actually when I came to London and after two years in London, my style just went away. <laughs> and now, now I'm super comfortable. Gabby, thank you so much. We had to cut that one short. We would have gone for a couple more hours, probably. This is one of those conversations that I had so much fun. And that's the beauty of this medium. There is no time limit. There are no, you know, I love having people back multiple times. That's obviously you've been listening to the podcast. Hey, maybe this is your first time ever listening to this podcast. If so, welcome. We're closing in on 800 episodes, I think, at this point. And this is what we do here. There's no structure. There's no form. So sometimes there's structure. Sometimes there's form. But it's a very flexible medium in my mind. And I just love connecting with people. It's the sort of thing that I would want to be doing anyway. And having a podcast is just a side benefit. And boy... Oh, it's been a nice outlet, actually. Life has gotten really busy for old Jason, which I know is a good problem to have for someone in the music world at the moment. But I have, I, I, my, my quote unquote day job has taken up more and more of my time and mental energy, and it's great. I welcome it. I work for Eastman Strings. I'm the one of the Strings product managers, and I do new product development and social media and all kinds of stuff. And it's been a lot of fun. But the last. Oh, 
couple months, maybe, I've lost all sense of time. I've come on in a bigger role, and so balancing my time has just been more of an issue. But, you know, I schedule these podcast interviews, and that's a break from any of the to-do lists I have, either through Eastman or other projects that I do, and I'm, I wear a lot of hats. And just to turn off the devices, to turn off the notifications, to close out the email, and to just sit down and connect with somebody for however long, an hour or two or whatever, that is so therapeutic for me. And I hope you enjoy it too. Maybe you've been listening for 15 years or almost 15 years at this point. Uh, maybe you're new or relatively new, but welcome. Thank you for being on this journey with me. Thank you to the people that put these episodes together. Mitch Mooring, Trevor Jones, Michael Cooper, and Steve Hinchy. Krista Copper has done such epic work cataloging what we talk about in these episodes for a few years at this point. She's stepping off to do some other projects. So I am at the very end of this episode <laughs> putting a, a little uh, request or or just, just putting the word out. If anybody wants to write down at what point in the episodes we talk about various topics, that is incredibly helpful for projects where we synthesize different material together. I was called calling that position like cataloging and archival or librarian or anything like that, that is uh, certainly not the most glamorous job, but but boy, Krista, thank you so much for doing that all these years. If anybody out there would be interested in doing that, uh, hit me up, feedback at ContraBasedConversations.com, and we can talk about it. It's in a volunteer position, but it's something that, um, I don't know. I don't know what will end up happening with that. It has been quite useful. I haven't done as many of these compilation episodes since the pandemic hit, for a variety of reasons. One, one is just like I'm home all the time and I uh, a lot of the time these uh, highlight episodes have been great when I'm going out of town for a long time and then I can set these and then I don't have to worry about having regular content to put on the podcast. Not that there's, I just have a self-imposed schedule of two things a week. There's no one telling me to do that or not do that, but uh, I'm babbling. <laughs> but uh, I, I also think that there's some sort of book in the future with the this podcast, and I think those highlight episodes are kind of like chapters in what will eventually be in a book, and who knows when that book is coming. As we get into bigger projects like that, I'm sure that some some pay would be involved because it would be even more work. But anyway, that is a long and rambling way of saying if that's of interest at all to you, uh, let me know. And Mitch Mooring makes beautiful bases in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, award-winning bases. Look him up at MitchMooring.com. And yeah, thank, thank you for listening. I am your host, Jason Heath, and we'll see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum.